The only name that matters to me The only one whose favor I see The only name that matters to me Yours would be The friendship and affection I need To feel my father smiling on me
hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to you. Ushers can come on up. I'll take up the offering at this time.
Pastor Dave, if you want to come on up. Just continue to praise the Lord for a moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Allow your Holy Spirit, God, to lead and to guide, to minister and to touch. Lord, we come before you this morning, Father, and we desire to see your face, Lord, to look upon the glory of heaven, to feel the hand of God reaching into our hearts and into our lives, breathing strength and hope and praise into us, Lord. Father, as we come here tonight, we lay aside every burden and every weight, Lord. Father, we clear the table. Lord, that we might just focus upon you, Lord, that our, our hearts might be full of you this morning. Lord, I ask right now that your Holy Spirit begin to just touch every wounded person in this building, Father. We know that you have come to bind up the brokenhearted, that you have come to heal every wound, Father, to fill every need. Lord, we come to this place looking for you, declaring that you are the center of the world and all of our lives, Father, revolve around you. You are the glorious one of heaven, the king of our lives, the leader of our lives. And Father, we just release you right now in the name of Jesus Christ to bind up every brokenhearted, to carry every burden, Father. We cast our cares upon you this morning and declare before the world that we have a God that cares for us, that looks down upon us with love, that lifts us up, that feeds and, and pours into us. We appreciate you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's give the praise and worship team a hand clap, would you, for doing such a great job this morning? Before we get started this morning, I want to share something with you. And I want you to take it well. All right? I want to speak a word of encouragement. But you have to look for encouragement sometimes because it's quick to judge it wrongly. As we were singing the next to the last song and Scott and them were just playing, there was somebody in the building this morning that the Lord was ministering to to speak a word. Now, first of all, grace covers it. You're not in trouble. Don't leave this place feeling condemned and convicted and none of that trash because that's the, that's the work of the enemy. Do you understand me? The Lord says it's okay. He loves you. But I, as your pastor, I want to beseech you the next time we're in worship and you feel the Lord give you the unction to speak a word of encouragement for the church, I challenge you this morning, be strong. Go forward to do great exploits. Come and speak the word of the Lord. Amen? How many is willing to allow people the freedom to speak the word of the Lord? Can you raise your hand? See that? Look at all these hands up. Be encouraged and be obedient. Amen? Praise the Lord. Do we have children's ministry? Or taller? Yes. Well, come right ahead. It's just a quick word that the Lord gave me, and I said, well, if Pastor David asks for that, I will share it. But as soon as... As exactly at that same time when they were just playing instrumentally and when the drums started, doom to doom to doom, doom to doom to doom, I heard, I will fight for you. 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 I will fight for you over and over and over again. The Lord is telling us that body. He, we are his body and he will fight for you. I will fight for you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord this morning. God is a faithful God who never fails us. Amen. Do we have children's ministry, toddlers ministry this morning? Yes, toddlers dismissed. What is it, four and down? Is that, is that right? Four and down can be dismissed to go to toddlers ministry. If the rest of you would, turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 1. I'd like to start about verse 11. John chapter 1. It is almost, I, my watch says 1030. That means you praised God for 45 minutes. So that means that I can preach for 45 minutes, right? <laughs> John chapter 1 and verse 11 says, And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him. Raise your hand if you've received the Lord this morning. 
as many as have received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believed on his name. Power to become son. What does it mean to be a pow- the power to become the son of God? And that's not just talking to men, all right? This, this word sons means all the children, right? Sons of God. The power, it's the, it's the anointing, it's the ability, it's the authority to become the sons of God. And to become a son of God is simply to take on the nature of the Father and to begin to work in accordance to the will of the Father. Do you understand? God has great things to accomplish and He is empowering us when we believe upon Jesus Christ to go forward and accomplish those great things. Somebody told me one time, they said, if you go to church and close your eyes, it's like listening to your father. Well, I don't do that on purpose. If, in fact, the first couple of years I preached, I try really hard not to sound like my father until I realize I was messing myself up. All I can do is be who I am, right? But when we become like the father, then we begin to portray the nature of the father. It begins to come out in us. We begin to do the things that God wills for us to do and accomplish the things that God wills for us to accomplish. We begin to love like God loves and, 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 and help like God helps and, and be strong like God is strong. And the very nature of God begins to come out of us because God gives us the power to become his sons. How many knows that if you take a cow and you breed it to a bull, it doesn't give birth to a lamb. Right? You don't mate two elephants and get a giraffe. You, the, the, the children take on the nature and characteristics of the Father, right? So when we become the sons of God, we begin to be more like God is. It says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. How many can say you beheld the glory of God? How many in your life have looked and seen the hand of God moving? You felt the Spirit of the Lord breathing upon you. Heard the Word of God speaking to you. We behold the glory of God. You know, it's important to behold the glory of God because you can only become what you behold. You can only act like what you've seen. You can, if you want to be a good father, you need to see what good fathership is before you can walk in that. If you want to see what, 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 what it is to be a good wife, you have to behold what it is to be a good wife in order to, to, to do that. If you have no, no understanding or vision of what you should be, then you'll never walk in what you can be. Somebody say amen. He says, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God is full of grace and truth. We've been working on grace for a few days now, and I, I don't expect this morning to be much different. We're still working on grace. But understand when he's talking about Jesus being the very image of the Father, he's talking about him being full of grace and truth. He goes on and he says, And of his fullness have we all received. Have all we received. And grace for grace. I think I skipped a verse. 15 says, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And his fullness we all have received. Let me ask you a question. I'm, I, I, sometimes I, I, I'm not quite where I want to be to get started this morning, but yet these little things keep popping out at me in the Scripture. How many understand what it means that we have received the fullness of God? Do you understand that To receive the fullness of God is to receive all that God has for you. It doesn't mean to walk in all that God has for you. That's a lifelong process. But to receive the fullness of who God is and what He has means that when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ into our lives and make Him our Lord and Savior, everything He is, everything He has done, everything that has been poured out upon people, it is yours. It's not like you receive salvation and then you work really hard to receive righteousness and you work really hard to receive holiness and then you work really hard to receive healing and then you work really hard. No, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, God as a a Christmas present gave you a box with all of the fullness of God in it. You have it all, but you may not have unwrapped it all. God has given you everything that you need But yet sometimes it takes us a while to uncover it and begin to understand, oh, this is mine. 
I remember one time when I was a kid for Christmas, I got a, 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 a great big box, and when I opened the box, there was a lot of paper inside, and, and I had to start throwing out the paper. Anybody ever done this to a kid? What a cruel evil. No. I mean, you, for a month, you think you got this huge gift, and you start throwing stuff out, and you get right down in the bottom, and finally you find the gift. This is what I got. This is what I've unwrapped. And it was great. And, 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 and as I was, you know, all excited and playing with it, my mom looks at me and she says, there's more. And so I start pulling out the rest of the paper and, and, and down towards the bottom I find the, you know, the accessories and stuff that went with the toy that I got and the batteries that went in and all the stuff that go with it. But see, there was more in the box than I initially found. And I share with you, God has given you a gift, Christ Jesus dwelling within you, and we have yet to uncover all of the fullness that God has already placed within us. The grace of God has given us the fullness of God within ourselves, and as we dig within our relationship with God and dig into who we are and dig into what He's given us, we will continually pull out more and pull out more. You'll find gifts you didn't know you had. You'll find callings that you didn't know you had. You'll find peace and favor and joy that you didn't know you could walk in, but when you look back, you realize, I've always had that. I just didn't know how to trust in it. Are you with me this morning? The next verse says, or that same verse at the end says, and grace for grace, which is a very odd statement, grace for grace. In a common English language, we don't use this kind of terminology very much, grace for grace. It, you look at it and it's, it, it's hard to, you know, kind of, at least for, for you know, this guy from Missouri, that, that, that statement doesn't make a lot of sense, so you start digging into it. And you start uncovering, what does it mean, grace for grace? And when you look the word for up, it's the word anti, which we normally use to mean an opposite to, right? And anti-fungus means that it kills fungus. Are you with me this morning? But if you read the full definition of that word, you find out that it also sometimes means in place of or instead of. So what God is saying here is we have grace for grace, for grace, we get grace, and then we get more grace, and then we get more grace, and when we get more grace, it's like grace piled on top of grace, piled up on top of grace. And every time you discover a grace, there's more grace to go up on top of it. And every time you walk in a grace, there's more grace to walk in. And it's this piling up upon top of each other until there's a fullness of God at work in your life. In the Old Testament, it said we go from glory to glory. From We go from this this blessing that we're in to the next blessing that we're coming in. God is full of grace and truth and is continually pouring out grace and truth to us. Sometimes we think we got it only to find out it goes way farther than we realized. Amen? He says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I was reading that one day and I thought, you mean they didn't have grace and truth before Jesus? Not in the level that we have it today. This word came, in the Greek starts with the word gen, which is the same root word where we get generator or to generate. Grace and truth was brought into our lives. It was brought into being by Jesus Christ. When you look at the Old Testament and you look at the law, you find rules, regulations, and condemnation that, that, that come with not being able to perform. But when you look at this New Testament grace and truth that has grace upon grace upon grace, you find that the grace covers everything we've done. It covers every mistake we've made. It covers all of our shortcomings. It covers all of our failures. It covers all of our inabilities. It covers everything that could be an excuse why we're not what God wants to be and it lifts us up and creates us to be what God wants us to be. We have a problem in that we want to define ourselves by what we do. God defines you by what Jesus did. Are you listening to me? We think if we can live good enough, we'll be holy. God says, no, when you understand I've made you holy, it will cause you to live right. You hear me? 
When you find out who you are in God, it changes your perception of yourself. It changes your understanding of what's going on in your heart and your life and your mind. And when sin and different things come and tries to push theirself into your life, it's not that you're perfect. It's not that you won't make mistakes. But as a whole, you look at that stuff and you run from it because you no longer have a desire for what you used to desire. You found grace for grace and glory for glory and your heart longs to be like God. Nobody's ever been righteous because of what they did, ever. We've only been righteous because of faith in God. Let me read this to you out of the Amplified real quick, just this one verse. It says, For out of His fullness or abundance, we have all received, we've all had a share, and we were all supplied with one grace after another. And spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. And even favor upon favor and gift heaped upon gift. Does that explain it a little better? Grace for grace for grace. Grace piled on top of grace. Gift piles up on top of gift. Favor piles up on top of favor. And the more we walk with God and the more we allow God to work and move in us, the more we understand that God is doing a great and a mighty work within us and creating us to be not what we had hoped to be, but far beyond what we ever thought we could be. We limit God because we look at ourselves and we think, well, you know, I could probably do this, but I don't think I could ever do that. And God says, go to the limits of what you think your abilities are and then let me take you well beyond that. If you have reached the limit of what you think God has for you, you have not reached the limit of what God has for you. The grace of God came, up, came to give us the power, the authority, and the gifting to do what He has called us to do. There's no excuse as big as God's grace. Religion teaches us that who we are is determined by what we do. But if that is so, if we are, who we are is determined by what we do, then how can God look at scared Gideon who was hiding in a wine press and call him a mighty man of valor before he'd ever went to fight? He's still scared and hiding and God says you're a mighty man of valor. He looks at Abraham who's never had children and is well beyond the years of childbearing and says you are the father of many nations. He walks out into a void and darkness and he says let there be light and the darkness and void has to leave as light appears. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not bound by what you've done. The only thing that has bound you is the lack of believing in what God says you can be. Grace takes you farther. Faith takes you beyond the limits of your life into the greatest things you could ever imagine. Somebody says, yeah, but, but I have done this, and I've done that, and I'm disqualified for this, and I'm disqualified for that. But the Bible said where sin does abound, grace much more abounds. God's not okay with you sinning, but He's telling you I'm giving you power to come out of it, I'm giving you power to get over it, and I'm giving you power to get beyond it. Some people have been forgiven, but they can't forget who they are. They think who they are is just bound by what they've done. God doesn't care what you've done. He just cares where you can go. Let God take you past it. Let God get you away from it. Let God truly take that and cast it as far as the east is from the west so you recognize, boy, I was really messed up back there, but because of His grace, He has made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, has torn the limits off of the horizons, and I can go as far as God's grace will take me. Do you believe that this morning? I think when Paul says this one thing, what he's saying is this is the secret of my success. This is the thing that has made me great. This is the thing that's taken me beyond everybody else. This one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind and I reach forth for the prize of the high calling of God. Reach for the mark. I share with you tonight, this morning, that so many of us are judging ourselves and others by the past when God doesn't care about it anymore. He's looking to the future. He's looking to what He has in store. He's looking to the, to the days that are coming and the great things that He has to do. He's looking at us and He's seeing Gideons who would be mighty men of valor and, and Peters who, who seem like maybe they got a big mouth and always getting in the way, but He knows that they're going to use them for... I might even fall into that category anyway God is looking at us and seeing what he wants to do in our life 
and we look at ourselves and we see the mistakes that we've made, God is saying, forget it and let's go forward. Let me mold you and make you into something greater than you have imagined for yourself. Do you all know why God was so hard on Moses when Moses made his big mistake? Remember God tells Moses to speak to the rock and instead he hits the rock and speaks to the people. You know why God was so mad? It's the same reason I'm sure he gets frustrated with us sometimes. Thank God grace of Jesus Christ keeps us from being taken up on top of the mountain and taken home, amen? They walk through this wilderness all of this way and every time they come to a situation, God does a new miracle. Every time they're without, God does a new miracle. Whether it's parting the Red Sea, putting the pillar of fire, causing the wind to blow, whether it's causing manna to fall from heaven, or whether it's causing the cloud to cover them by day, or whether it's turning the bitter waters sweet, it makes no difference. Every time they get in a bad situation, God does something new. Moses, out of his own frustrations, goes back to what God did last time. And the reason why God is so upset about that is because Moses had the grace to go forward and he chose to go backwards. Moses had the gift and the grace of God to do what God told him to do, but he refused to do what God told him to do because he was mad at people. Are you with me? And it's not the people's fault. It's Moses' fault. He chose to fail. Are you hearing me? He chose not to walk in the grace that was given him. We look today, and we have this Bible. We have these, these 66 books, and we have miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. We have deliverance after deliverance after deliverance after deliverance. And God is always moving and doing these new things. And, and, and it takes from the beginning of the book all the way to the end of the book just to give you a description of, of, of the many things that God can do to deliver us. And yet we hold God back because we want God to do it the way he's done it before. Right? We see some, God do something great for somebody. Well, I wish God would do that. I've been believing for 20 years for God to do that for me because he did it for them. Quit believing God to do for you what he did for somebody else and start believing God to do what he wants to do for you. You've got your own unique miracle in store. You've got your own unique gifting and calling. You've got your own unique encounters with God. God doesn't have to give you the same vision he gave somebody else. He's got something brand new every day for you. We hold God back by trying to put him in a box and make him do what he's always done. The point of those miracles being different over and new and new and new and new and new and is to get us to understand, I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he's going to do it. When I was a kid, we used to watch you know, TV shows, and you always knew the good guy was going to win. The star of the show can't die or the show's over, right? So you're watching this thing, and you're watching this whole thing play out, and you know the good guy's going to win. You're just trying to figure out how. I share with you, that's the way it is with us and God. You know God is going to come through. You know He's going to win. You know He's going to bless you. But quit trying to make Him bless you like He blessed you last time and just open up the doors of your heart and say, God, whatever's in store is going to be a good thing. Amen? You look at, you, you look at Joshua and, well, you look at Joshua and Joshua stops the sun. A few years later, Isaiah says, that's pretty good, but watch this. And he makes the sun go backwards. I mean, it probably took more faith to make it go backwards than just to stop. You look at Moses, and Moses parted the water. Jesus walked on it. You get my drift? Every time we see something unfold or something happen, God doesn't have to go back and do it that way again. He can do something new. He can take what we have seen and he can take it farther. He can do a miracle that we've seen him come through with and he can do something even greater. It's time that we take the limits off God and understand that I have grace upon top of grace upon top of grace. God doesn't have to do an old thing. He's got a new thing. The grace for yesterday was great, but the grace for today is going to take us even farther. Stop looking for the old God to show up and just expect God to do something new every day of your life. He says in his word, behold, I do a new thing. Why are we always looking for the old thing when God has a new thing? I don't know if you're with me this morning or not. How many is ready to see God do some new things in your life? How many is ready to see God go from, the, from that old faithful to a brand new outpouring? Amen. 
We get tired of, 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 of listening to people, well, you know, I, I'm, for 20 years I believe in God to do this. Well, you know what? Maybe you should just believe God to be God. I know that's kind of tomping on toes, but listen, we, God is not motivated by your need for a sign. God's motivated by the depth of His love for you. You hear me? He's not motivated by your need for signs and wonders, but He's motivated because He wants to pour out good gifts into your life to do great things for you, to take you to the next level, to tear down the, 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 the barriers and the things that you have in your mind and, and to show you that His grace is so sufficient for you that not only can He do the great things He did for somebody else, but He can go even farther. And in the process of growing farther, we begin to understand it's not really about us, it's about Him. We want God to move, but He's the one who's really creative. Right? He's the one that really knows how to, how to blow our minds. We find in the time of Moses, before God sent Moses back to Israel, that the Israelites were in bondage. Now, if you really study this, what you'll find is there was a large portion of the Israelites who were worshiping false Egyptian idols. They'd been in bondage there 400 years. For 400 years, they'd been exposed to this false religion and these false gods. And there was a large percentage of the, of the Israelites who were worshiping false idols. But yet God, when they cry out to Him, sends forth a deliverer. You understand, He doesn't send forth a deliverer because Israel deserves it. Come on, church. It's time the church takes this deserve it mindset and throws it in the garbage. God's never going to do something for you because you earn it or because you deserve it. He only moves because he loves you and you are trusting and believing in him to do it. Right? They're, they're, they're caught up in false idol worship, but yet they call out to God and God sends them a deliverer. Not just from their physical bondage, not just a deliverer to take them out of slavery, but a deliverer to take them on to something greater and something better. God could have just set them free and let them stay there. How many realize that, that, that in you know, the, the late 1800s, you know, we had a, a civil war in the United States and we had the Emancipation Proclamation and all of the slaves in America were set free. And they still live there. God didn't have to take them out to set them free. But he didn't just want to set them free from their physical slavery. He wanted to set them free from their spiritual slavery, from the spiritual bondage, from the, from the bondage that had gone on in their minds as being raised up as slaves. He wanted to take them out of this place of bondage and into a place of overcoming and a place of glory and a place that flowed with milk and honey and a place where they could look and they see that God is at move everywhere across our nation. And I share with you, God wants to do the same thing with you. You don't have to go to Israel to find it, but you are going to have to leave the confines of your mind. You're going to have to tear down the barriers of, of who we've always been and the barriers of the way we've always done it and the barriers of, of how we think about ourselves. I'm not some old sinner that was saved by grace. I was an old sinner and that old sinner died upon an altar when he called upon the name of the Lord and was born again and the shed blood of Jesus remade, remade me new and whole. And he does the same thing for you. And when I look at the temptations of the old life, I laugh and I say, that's not me any longer. Come on, church. I'm not saying I never fail. That would be a lie. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm all gifted and all whatever. That's just foolishness. I'm no better than the next guy that has called upon the name of the Lord because the righteousness that I stand in is the righteousness of the robes of Christ Jesus. You hear me? The roof I'm standing under is no better than the roof you're standing under. We're all under the same roof. The righteousness that I stand in is the same righteousness that you stand in. It's the righteousness of Christ Jesus. I don't put my hope and my trust in who I am and what I can do. I put all of my hope and my trust a long time ago in who He is and what He can do. And the same God that started the work is the same God that will finish the work. And the same God that gave me the grace for salvation is the same God that gives me grace every time I come up against the wall. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. As we begin to unveil and unfold who God is and what He's done for us, just like the children of Israel, He begins to lead us away from false idols and He begins to lead us away from the things that keep us bound and lead us away from the things that, that turn us around. And I'm telling you, 
you can't really walk into freedom in God until you're willing to walk away from who you used to be. It's that simple. I don't care what your background is. I'm not talking about, I'm not really talking about backgrounds. I'm not really talking about cultures. I'm not really talking about what church you used to go to or what religion you used to go to. What I'm saying is, I used to be a man, but now I've been made something greater. You hear me? If you've been born again, you're greater than a man. You're a new creation. God and man merged into one as God dwells within us. That's greater than manhood. That's godliness. Can you give the Lord a hand clap this morning? Take the things that we've seen God do and then believe God for greater things. Sam, in, the, in, the, in the 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse Verse 6, I'm, I'm not going to turn to it and read it, but you can go back and read it later if you want. The, chapter 3 of the book of Samuel tells a story about how God calls this young boy named Samuel and how he's laying there asleep and, and a voice calls and says, Samuel, Samuel, and he says, here am I, but he doesn't see nobody. So he, he, he lays back down and hears Samuel, Samuel. So he gets up and he goes and he, and he finds Eli the priest. He thinks the priest must be hollering at him. And he says, here I am. And Eli says, so what? I didn't call you. Go lay back down. So he goes and lay back down and he hears a voice again. And Eli tells him, the next time it is, just say, here I am, Lord. But in those verses of Scripture in the beginning, it says that God is calling to Samuel, but it says, Samuel did not know the voice of God. I, I have a question. I wonder how many of us this morning God is calling out to, but we haven't yet experienced the understanding of knowing when it's God's voice. I wonder how many of us God is calling to new things, but we haven't yet identified the voice of God. I wonder how many of us God is, is calling to new gifts and, and new callings. And maybe, maybe this is your church, but maybe God wants you to go not just to this church, but maybe He wants you to step out of this church a couple of times a week. Maybe He wants you to witness, or maybe He wants you to evangelize, or maybe He wants you to support somebody else in what they're doing, or maybe that God is, is beginning to pull forth new calls and, and new giftings in your life, and He wants you to begin to operate in a gift that you've never operated in or he's wanting you to take a position that you've never taken before I wonder this morning if there's not those here today that God is calling to more but yet we haven't yet identified it I share with you this morning it wasn't the greatness of Samuel that caused, caused God to call him it was the greatness of God that continued to call him he didn't know who it was, and he didn't know who it was, and he didn't know who it was, but God kept calling. And I share with you this morning, because we have grace upon top of grace, and favor upon top of favor, and, and, and gift being poured out upon top of gift, God may not have been heard by you yet, but he hasn't stopped calling you. Listen for the voice of God. Be open to the leaders of the Holy, the leadership of the Holy Spirit because as we continue to take breath, it means that God has more for us. If you wake up tomorrow, God has more for you than he had for you today. You hear me? I've, I've, getting, I've gotten around people that, that, you know, I, I was talking to a pastor one time, and he used to be a pastor, and he, he and pastored for a few years, and things went well, and then some things happened, and, and he felt, got hurt, and he got wounded, and he got offended, and he, and he quit his church, and now it had been several years, and he didn't do anything in ministry, and he looked at me, and, and he said something along the lines of, well, I guess God was just finished with me. I did my work, and I said, that ain't true. You're still breathing, ain't you? If you're still breathing, God's still got work for you. If you get up this morning, God has something new and something fresh. The Word declares that He's calling us from grace to grace, from glory to glory. Look at your neighbor and say, there's better coming than we've ever had before. God's not done yet. Amen. The power of God's grace in your life is the same power Cause God to look at Gideon. Cause that angel to come to him and said, you're a mighty man of valor. The first time I looked at that, I was almost embarrassed for him. Here he is hiding in the wine press, trying to thresh wheat, hoping nobody comes and steals it all. And hiding out and scared, God calls him a mighty man of valor. I wonder how many mighty men of valor we have in here this morning. We just ain't had a chance to prove it yet. Amen? I wonder how many Isaiahs and how many Ezekiels and I wonder how many Davids and how many, how many uh, uh, Solomons we have in this building but yet we ain't had the chance to prove it yet. 
All it takes is one word from God to turn you from hiding in a wine press to leading an army. You hear me? All it takes is, is one recognition of the voice of God to take you from being in bondage to liberating you into the glory of what God has for your future. And the best news of it all is God's still calling. He's still crying out your name. He's still calling out to your heart. He's still trying to be heard. And if we would just turn our heart and attention to the Lord and allow God to begin to speak to us and begin to listen for that voice, when we hear the call of God to just answer and say, Here am I, Lord. Samuel could have said, Well, it can't be God because I'm just a boy. But he didn't. Right? Gideon could have said, I can't be a mighty man of valor. Actually, he goes on and he says, but I'm the least of my household who is the poorest family around. In other words, I'm the nobody in the group of nobodies. Right? And yet God calls him to lead an army to set the nation free from oppression. I wonder how many nobodies who are really somebodies that God has sitting in this congregation this morning. You see... We're too busy looking with these instead of looking with this. We're too busy looking for what we want instead of looking for what God has. And we, we surrender and just say, Lord, I'm yours to do with as you will. And whatever that will is, I want to find your plan and your purpose and your way. Then we open a door in our life that's never been opened before. The door where God begins to do things you've never let him do before. I want you to stand to your feet with me. The thing that we have to remember about the Holy Spirit 